Welcome back. Same cup. Same outfit. I slept in them last night. <laughs> what can I do for you? Okay, hole in the wall again. What about it? So, the screenplay, our miniseries that we're putting together, season one and two, you and Tony are growing up in Chicago. Seasons three and four, you guys are in Vegas. So the hole in the wall gang, guys, we may have to condense them, but I want to know more about them. So let's talk about Joe Blasco, the, the cop. Did he... Former Metro cop? Yes. Colada, colada, grab your favorite brew. Ask a question, he'll answer it for you. The mafia, the mafia, the mafia, the mafia. You better hit prescribe if you know what's good for you. Drinking a cup of coffee with Frank Colada. He'll tell you a lot. Of, he's Frank Colada. You know, the only time I'm... When I first met Blasco, I met him through Tony Splotcher, most naturally. And I met him at Tony's house uh, in Vegas. I felt a little uncomfortable around him because he was the next guy. I could tell he was a tough bastard, too. He was, Tony told me he used to play baseball. Physically, the guy, I'm sure he could whip me with, with no trouble. And uh, Tony told me his track record that he was, uh, he killed somebody, a prisoner, he beat him to death. Or this is what Tony told me. And then he come to Tony, he went and he jumped size because he got fired. Or he quit the force, whatever. So Tony put him to work. And I think Tony said he was giving him anywhere from 500 to 800 a week. I don't know how true that is. But uh, he always was by Tony's sauce. As a matter of fact, that's the only time I've ever seen him was by Tony's sauce. He never went to the saloons or anything. He was a family man. He had a wife. I think he had two boys that eventually turned out to be sure saw there in Las Vegas. They're active right now. And matter of fact, one of them looks just like his father, Joe. I met him. Uh, but the only down thing, the only thing I didn't like about Joe is he was a former policeman. Uh, and he was invited in on the birthday robbery through Tony because Tony, I guess he got tired of giving the guy money. You know, I guess to be costly after a while. And I was totally against it, but Tony was my boss. And I was told what I should do with him, I should make his position what it would be as far as listening to the police calls. That's all he had to do. So that's about a bad last call. Okay. <clears throat> Ernie Davino. He, um, what, what was his specialty? I mean, what did he do? What he was... had no, no specialty. He was a burglar. Okay. I thought if Ernie ever opened up a door as to perform a burglary, uh, I would say that was Leo that always opened up the doors. Mm -hmm. Ernie was, uh, he carried the merchandise. He was the lookout while Leo was rummaging through the house. Uh, I guess somebody was in there, they tried to jump on Leo. Ernie was a rather tough individual. He could probably handle a guy with ease. Uh, maybe drive the work car, yeah, when they would leave the score. And they would go to wherever they were going with the stolen merchandise. No. I guess you want to know when I met Ernie. Sure. I met Ernie in probably 1979. And I met him through a guy by the name of Joey DeFranco. That was Johnny DeFranco's brother, Johnny No. He was living in Vegas. Now, Joey DeFranzo didn't socialize with Tony. Tony didn't like Joey, I think, but he never was around Tony. So Joey and I got, we were friends, and he told me that he was doing stuff with this guy by the name of Ernie, and he told me that Ernie was a masseuse at the Las Vegas Country uh, Athletic Club. I said, what does he do? He rubs people's bodies. He said, yeah, what kind of man does that? He said, he makes money. I said, what are, what are you doing with him? He said, he gives me tips. On what? He's these guys, they go in there, they got a lot of money. They got lockers. And he robs their lockers, and I help them. So they got three, four thousand, you take a thousand, throw it down. Yeah. He said, I get old quick. He said, there's one guy he wants to get. 
his name is Joe Pignatelli. And I said, are you nuts? Joey, that guy owns Villa Diaz. He was Sam Giancana's guy. He says, he's always in there with 20, 30,000. I said, you got to pass on that one, Joey. So then Joey talked Ernie out of being doing that. Uh, he said, you got to slow down on that. But in the, in the meantime, I hooked up with Leo Gardino, who was from Chicago that lived in Vegas. He was trying to get a job. Couldn't get a job. So I hooked him and Ernie up together. Joey DeFranza went off into the wilderness. So they start stealing together. I put that crew together. And, uh, and Leo was the boss. Uh, I was his boss. So Ernie became this burglar now. Give up his job. I think he was married and got divorced or separated. But in that while there, Joey DeFranza was going out with a lady by the name of Loretta, a rather nice, attractive woman, an older woman. So Ernie, Joey broke up with her, and Ernie sort of fell in love with her and started dating her. So that caused a division between Joey and Ernie, and there became a fight over it, and Ernie beat the shit out of Joey. And then Joey thought I sicked him on him, and I did. And I tell him, no, no, it's all about a woman, man. I says, he was mad, you know, he, it was your girlfriend, then he took her from you. I says, that's it. So, uh, I never really liked Ernie. I tolerated him. I can't say I hated him. I didn't trust him. I was something sneaky about him. And I proved to be, you know, I was right. God knows how much stuff he probably pocketed on a burglary. But Ernie, Leo was a real trusting guy. He really trusted everybody. He only, went, he only wanted to see the good things in people. And then I filled other guys in on this crew of guys. Now, who else would you want to talk about? Wayne Mateki. Wayne Mateki was always my guy. He used to work for me in Chicago when I had a big discotheque. Actually, he was a friend of my brother's. And my brother says, he's a nice guy. He looks like a, a Mickey Demo. He said, oh, the guy's a karate expert, this, that. So I put him to work as a bouncer, Thurman. Very loyal. Very loyal. Said nothing. And I knew right away this guy was solid. So I tell him, we're going to use you. I'm going to use you. I don't like the word that use that name. Use. I says, and the other thing that you're going to be doing is you got a clean face. I says, you give up face to stick up somebody because there's no record of you and they can't put a finger on you. You got a clean face. So I used them for that. I says, and burglaries. Are you in for it? He says, yeah, absolutely. So that was Wayne's functions. That's as clear as I can make it to you. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I heard he was into electronics. He did a lot of electronics. You heard wrong. Okay. I don't know where you heard that. Okay. Um, was he, uh, you say he's very loyal. Was he married? A little bit on that side. Kids? Did he have kids? Or was he married? Did he? Oh, I, you know, he wasn't married when I knew him. But I don't know if this... When, we, when I was testifying him on a murder case, there was a guy in the courtroom uh, sitting in the front row. And I had to look twice at Wayne and this guy. Because they looked alike. They were identical. And then I come to find out later, he had a twin brother. He never told me this. Why would they do that? He could be the case on that. Huh. If I identified him in court and his brother stand up, who's this guy? Yeah. So he had a twin brother. Wow. So, um, um, so 
off of off of Wayne Metecki, we talk about Larry. We talked about uh, uh, Ernie. Um, um, when you're putting your crew together, what qualities did you look for in in the person? Somebody that knew what they were doing, that wasn't stupid. Somebody that uh, would stand up solid, that wouldn't roll, uh, wouldn't talk our business on the street, uh, who was qualified to be a burglar, let's say, uh, how to open up doors, how to rob stuff, use a gun, stuff like that. Just like you, you do it for college exams. All right. Um, all right. Enough about the hole in the wall game. See, Adam is asking me questions, and that's sort of cute in a way. Because he's trying to write this book. Uh, it's not like uh, I'm getting a bunch of college-educated guys, putting them together to do a robbery. What I will say is if I put a score together, if I had, I sure wouldn't have used their knowledge, college kids, to put a score together. Because we didn't even caught a long time ago. They think all together different. In the Chicago outfit, the... Um, here's the question. Did the outfit ever control the mayor of Chicago, um, including Harold Washington? No. Uh, no, they never controlled uh, the mayors. Uh, they controlled the aldermans, the precinct captains, because these guys needed votes to stay in office. And one hand washes the other. It wasn't about money. No, we all knew what Richard Daly was. He would be like Tony Ricardo of the city, all right? Nobody touched him, and nor did he bother us guys. He never bothered us. He just wanted to make sure that all his little soldiers had the right jobs, the right things. They protect them. It's all politics then. It was a better city then. It's since changed. The black guy that he's talking about, I guess when they threw him in, the city was changing rapidly. Color-wise, you know. And uh, they put him in there. Burns was another one, the white woman. These were people that were just there. They were still being controlled by the precinct captains, the aldermans, all these politicians. And then Mayor Daly's son got in. As a matter of fact, Mayor Daly's son is the one who gave me immunity from prosecution. Daily Sun did? Yeah. Okay. So, um, <laughs> so let me ask you uh, a couple questions from the viewers, prescribers here. This Larry Palladino wants to know, have you ever heard of Matt Palladino from Rockford, Illinois? No, I haven't. Doesn't matter. I know of Palladino, and he used to own a, a discotheque in Chicago. I know his wife, too. I don't know what, I think he's probably dead by now. He was a legitimate guy. Tony Accardo was, do you describe him as being the, can you tell me this? It's like if we're talking mob 101, if any of the viewers don't understand the hierarchy of the Chicago outfit. You had the 42 game, Al Capone days, right? Yeah. After that, who was the main boss? Tony Accardo. Accardo. And after Accardo? It was depending who dropped that, who was around. I don't know the, the basic history of it. Yeah. I could tell you the solid guys was uh, Paul Rico. He was a solid guy. Sam Giancana. Uh, what other name? I can't. It's escaping my head. Oh, uh, Joey Ayupa. All right. Yes. And then the 42 gang come out of that. That was around Taylor Street. And each one of them was a boss. And they had guys working for them. So that's 42 guys with a crew of guys. And that's how that took off. Tony Ricardo wasn't from Taylor Street. He was from Grand and Ogden. Okay, that's about it there. Joe Ferriola? He's there later. Later. Yeah, that's later. Um, we were looking at pictures of Ayupa the other day and Ferriola. You said that this guy was just... Rotten to the core. I said he was mean to the core. Mean to the core. Joe Ferriola. Or, or Ayupa. Ayupa I would be referring to. 
Yeah, he was a very mean man. He was a. Uh, he wasn't the kind of guy you you went for coffee with. You know, grease boy used to go hunting for birds and eat. And uh, he was just a tough guy, no nonsense guy. Did you know Nick Rizzi? No. Didn't know him at all. Okay. Um, that's three segments. We've been going for an hour and a half. You're groping. You're looking for things. We've been going for an hour and a yeah, half. Yeah, for now when you got it, you know. I'm going to put a list together. Yeah, you do, like you usually do. I know, like I usually do. Yeah. I can see it in your eyes. Especially when you said like, electronic guy. We did have an electronic guy. Did you? Oh, yeah. Who? Oh, yeah. His name was Ronnie D'Angelo. He wasn't my guy. He was Tony's guy. Uh, Milwaukee Phil. These are the guys that control this guy, Ronnie D'Angelo. He used to make the silencers for our guns. As a matter of fact, he created the first portable police radio that exist that became existent in Chicago. He made it for me. Tony introduced me to him. He said, this guy is a genius, Frankie. He'll make whatever you need. He put stashes in cars. He could do it all. So I told him what I wanted and he made this radio. The only bad thing about it was if your lover had left it behind, you were true. You'd never get another one. So you had to make sure. So instead of having a guy in the car with the police radio, you could have him in the house with the walkie-talkie and the police radio. And he could communicate with the guy in the car with a walkie-talkie. Because say the police roll up on this guy in the car, the pickup car that picks you up. You didn't have a police radio, you had a walkie-talkie. They're going to let him go. Or maybe lock them up, but they're not going to know unless they heard that police calls. So that was the object of a police radio. And there was only four crystals, four different suburbs. So if you're going from Alba Park to say, I'm going to use different suburbs, Bowers Park, Stone Park, you just change, you put four crystals in there and you go to the suburb, you get air, just change channels. So he did his name was Ronnie D'Angelo. He made good silencers. Very good salad, sir. So there's a part of your story that I definitely want to put in uh, when you're younger, and that's the pay phones. You, know, oh, you like to talk own? about that? Babe. What talk. was the car? What, what, what the, we'll talk about it on another segment. Yeah? Okay. Then let's wrap. All right, it's a wrap. Anyway, I hope you just enjoyed this. This guy put me to work today. He's punishing me for hollering at him. All right? I'll never happen again. I just like him to do his own work, that's all. Because of you people. And he does. He does, but you know, there's a lot more to be said. And uh, let's hope I last. Cheers. <laughs>